So continuing our kind of discussions about kind of extra topics and image processing, what I want to talk about today is called image retargeting. Which is, uh, again, I think kind of a fun um, application. So I want to talk about kind of, um, this, this comes under some general, uh, this is like a general category, but there are, are things that kind of go along with it. There's like resizing, you know, also I'd call, you know, recompositing or reshuffling. You sometimes hear these words used. And it's also related, as we'll talk about, to inpainting, which you talked about last time. Remember, inpainting is when I have a region of the image that I don't want that I kind of scribble over and then erase it from the image, okay? So let's motivate things by talking about um, image resizing, okay? And so resizing is something that uh, naturally happens when I have, you know, a big image like a Hollywood movie, you know, 4K wide image, and I need to look at it on my phone or on my web browser, right? So there are lots of times where we are looking at, you know, an image and then we're changing its size, right? Now, you know, MATLAB's imresize command will do that for you. Um, but what I want to kind of focus on today is more about what if I don't want to necessarily keep the same aspect ratio, right? So for example, you know, the wide, wide screen of a movie theater is not quite the same aspect ratio as that of my HDTV or certainly not that of my smartphone, right? And so the question is, you know, if I'm not doing kind of a, you know, proportional resizing, how can I make the best looking image possible on my new device given my large image, okay? And so from image processing, we know a few answers to this question, right? So again, let's suppose this is my original image and I want to make this image square, okay? So let's, let's suppose I want to make a square image. I have a few choices, right? One possibility is that I just crop out a square of the image, right? So this shows, I believe, the, the gray border is the before size of the image, and the square is my crop. And so here, you know, this has the advantage that I'm not uh, compromising anything inside that window. But on the other hand, I'm throwing out a lot of material that was in the original image, right? And so this sometimes you see on old um, TV broadcasts of movies, they had what was called pan and scan, right? Which would mean that you'd be watching the movie and then the, the field of view, like you were looking through the window of your TV, would kind of move, if you're having a conversation between two people, kind of move back and forth between them, right? Because someone is turning a dial that is saying, okay, what is the four to three aspect ratio of my TV? Should, you know, which, which focus of the 16 by nine, you know, aspect ratio of the movie should I be focusing on, right? So this cropping is, you know, saving the image detail, but at the same time losing image content, right? An alternative is just taking my original image and squishing it down into that square, right? But then I'm going to screw up the correct, you know, um, what's the word? You know, the, the sizes and shapes of things, right? So like these cows now become super skinny, right? Because the new image is, you know, uh, skinnier than it was before, right? So this is going to distort image content in a way that is usually unacceptable. And so a more common thing to do uh, in terms of like what you may see on your TV at home is letterboxing, right? Where I don't throw away anything, but I put these black bars across the top and the bottom of the image to pad the image out to the aspect ratio that I have, right? And so, um, you know, this keeps the content, but at the same time, you know, I'm throwing away pixel real estate that I could hopefully be using better, right? I'm using up pixels on these black bars. So the question is, can we do better than any of these three possibilities, cropping, uh, squishing and letterboxing, okay? So, so here's a simple idea, right? So the simplest idea is, okay, so here's my image, and now suppose I want to resize that. One thing that I could do is I could have the user outline, okay, this is the most important part of the image to me, right? So suppose the user outlines this meerkat in the middle and then extends these lines up and down to build these nine regions of this image. So then what I could say is something like, okay, if I need to resize this image, keep the stuff in the middle, which we call the region of interest, keep that proportional, right? So that only gets resized by a scaling factor. And then the other eight regions of the image kind of proportionally squish those to fit into the remainder of the box, right? So here's an idea of like, here's my region of interest and here's a resizing of it, right? So here, what I'm doing is I'm making a square version of the image 
the meerkat is just being, you know, uh, proportionally magnified, but the shapes of the other regions are being definitely seriously changed, right? So for example, that upper left-hand corner, which used to be about twice as tall as it is wide, can get squished down to something that is like a smaller box. And so when I complete my image, I get something that, you know, maybe if you're looking at on your phone, you might not notice a big difference because the thing that you care about, the region of interest, is preserved, and the other stuff that you don't care about so much, even though it's squished, maybe you don't notice it, right? And so that's one possibility. Uh, and I would call that something like non-uniform warping, meaning that different parts of the image are getting treated in a fundamentally different way, right? And that's kind of a hallmark of the way that the good techniques work is by fundamentally um, trying to deal with different parts of the image in different ways, okay? Another thing that you can do, instead of asking the user to manually outline the thing they care about, there's a whole field of image processing research called saliency, okay? So saliency, the idea is, can we design an automatic algorithm that will take a look at an image and guess where a person might focus, okay? So there have been lots of user studies of showing people images and looking at their eye tracking and figure out what kinds of things human eyes are attracted to. And so we know things, for example, like, you know, eyes are attracted to color contrast, they're attracted to faces, they're attracted to edges. And so you can take an automatic algorithm and say, okay, here is my image, and I apply this kind of automatic saliency estimator to it, and I get kind of a grayscale image that says, these are the places that I think the person is likely to look at, right? And then this automatic saliency map kind of tells me, okay, so these now become automatically generated regions of interest that I could use to non-uniformly non warp, you know, different parts of the image, right? So, I mean, it'll probably work better if I have a human do it, but if I'm generating automatically lots of new content, I don't necessarily want to have a human annotating what's interesting. So these saliency detectors are, um, you know, okay, and they, and they work pretty well. So then I might use this. The other thing that we could do is, instead of looking at just kind of one region of interest, a natural idea is to say, okay, suppose I take this image and I split it up into rectangles, okay? And within each rectangle, I have a measure of kind of how important is this rectangle to preserve. And that importance could be a function of, like, edginess, right? So for example, in this image, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's probably not too important, right? Sky is all constant intensity. The sand is roughly constant intensity. But then there's a bunch of edginess here, and there's edginess around these people. And so this is an algorithm uh, called optimized scale and stretch. So here's a live demo. So the idea is I load in an image. I guess it takes a minute to render. And then what I can do is I can overlay on this image a grid that tells me something that could be as simple as, you know, what is the uh, significance at each pixel, right? And this you could think of as just basically like a color version of the edge map, right? So imagine I just look at the gradient magnitude at every pixel, right? And then I say, okay, when I have the user resize this image, I kind of look at the edginess inside every one of these blocks and I don't allow you to squish up blocks that are really important, right? So the idea is that what I can do, this is a nice interactive tool where I can grab the lower corner of this image and kind of push the image around. So here, what I'm doing is kind of making the image more like a square, right? And so I can see that what's happened is that the people over here they look about the same and they look undistorted, whereas I've kind of squished rectangles that used to be in the sky. And I can kind of see that from looking at this grid, right? So you can see that the rectangles or the squares that cover uh, regions that have a lot of gradient action are not getting squished. And the regions that are uh, you know, not that important or perceptually unimportant are getting significantly distorted, right? And so this is kind of a fun little you know, thing where I can kind of interactively drag the size of this image to make it um, change its aspect ratio, right? So if I kind of squish it back down this way, then this is kind of, you know, uh, I guess part of it is that I can't get the whole image on the screen. So if I squish it down even more. So now actually I squished it so far that I squished out the sky, basically. You can see that all of those rectangles up here got significantly, uh, you know, squished down. But, you know, again, if I had to make a representative version of this image that was at this scale, 
you know, actually I think it would look pretty, pretty good, right? And so, like I said, this algorithm is called optimized scale and stretch. And what you fundamentally do is you apply a cost function that says, how much do I, so all I'm doing is I'm taking this grid, right? So this is the visible grid. And you can imagine it's like an optimization problem over where should I put each vertex of the new grid, right? So the grid has to stay connected like a series of boxes put together, but I'm allowed to kind of move where those vertices of the boxes are. And so there's a cost function that basically says for important boxes, make it kind of stay a square. And for unimportant boxes, you know, don't distort it too much, right? Um, and so this is, this is kind of a neat little app. Um, so another exciting thing that came about a few years ago, I mean, probably almost 10 years ago now, in, um, in a computer graphics conference is called scene carving, right? So this is a kind of a fun technique for imagery sizing that actually is very um, easily understandable from, from what you guys understand. So OK, so here's, this is just still pictures of this. OK. So here's the idea. Suppose that I wanted to resize this image, OK? Suppose that I wanted to make it uh, skinnier. Okay, reducing the number of columns. So there are a bunch of possible ways I could do this, right? One way is I could just chop columns out of the image, right? Either from one of the edges or just, I mean, it would be kind of dumb, but I could chop them out from the middle, right? Every column that I remove would make the image one pixel narrower, right? The idea behind scene carving is, well, I don't actually have to remove columns. What I could do instead is I could remove what we call seams, which is just basically a one pixel wide path that goes from the top of the image to the bottom of the image, right? And so as long as that pixel is connected, it's kind of like saying I draw a little wavy line from the top to the bottom. And if I were to remove those pixels and push the rest of those pixels together, I didn't have an image that was one pixel less wide, right? And so the trick is choosing a good seam so that when I remove those pixels, the image looks pretty much the same as it did before, right? And so now knowing what we know from image processing, we have some idea about what would make a good scene, right? And so a natural thing to say is, OK, well, um, let me go back to my paper here. So scene carving. Right, the idea is I have an image. And let's suppose I want to make it one pixel narrower, right? And so what I have here is a path of pixels and I ask, what makes a good seam? And what I mean by good is that removing it should be imperceptible. Well, a very simple idea is just to say that I create a cost for my seam that's related to the gradients along that seam, right? So I could say I have a seam energy. So my seam is going to be something like, let's call it S. I compute an energy that says for all the pixels along this seam, Compute, for example, the x gradient magnitude plus the y gradient magnitude. And I want that to be low, right? Meaning that I want the seam to pass through edges, pass through places where there aren't a lot of edges, right? And then the algorithm is very simple. It just says, okay, so if I want to make an image, say, 10 columns narrower, I just start throwing away the cheapest seams, right? I take the best one, I throw it away. I take the second best one, I throw it away. And so um, here's the result of that. But let me just say for a second, so how would I find the best one? OK, so I gave you a cost function, but how do you minimize that cost function? Well, the easiest thing to do is with dynamic programming, right? And so the idea is to say, OK, so for show of hands, who knows about dynamic programming? Right? Half the class. So dynamic programming is basically saying, how would I keep track of the best seam? Well, the idea would be very simply, I say, okay, first I compute what if the seam was going through this pixel in the top row, or this pixel, or this pixel, right? And so each of these pixels initially gives me a cost, right? And then I say, okay, well, now suppose that I put this pixel on the seam, 
where could that have come from? Well, it could have either come from here or here or here, right? Because I need the seam to be connected, a connected path of pixels from top to bottom. And so basically here, what I can do is say, okay, well, the smartest thing to do would be to take the cheapest uh, previous guy and add to it my cost, right? So kind of what you have is at the bottom of the image, at the very end, you have like, you look for the lowest cost that is accumulated at the very bottom, and then you work your way back up to find out what was the path where things came from, right? So, and I, I'm sure that if you took data structures, you must have done a dynamic programming kind of thing at some point, right? So it's not too hard to program this up. It's very fast to do. Um, and then the results you get look something like this. So, um, for example, if I were to reduce that beach image, these red lines are, say, the 100 or whatever cheapest seams. And if I take those pixels out of the image, then I get an image that looks like this. And I think that, you know, again, the, you'll notice that this, none of the seams go through very edgy or interesting parts of the image, right? They don't go through the people. They don't go through the texture of the sand on the beach, right? They only go through flat regions. And here you can see they're kind of dodging around like this seaweed on the beach, you know, seems kind of go around it. And so when I remove that stuff, I get a, a version of the image that looks pretty much like it did before. The other thing I can do is use the same tactic to make images larger, right? So this is only for making images smaller, but I can use the same idea. Suppose I've got an image that's narrow and I want to make it bigger. Well, what I could do is say, okay, I'm going to find the lowest cost seams and those are the places where I'm going to add some stuff, right? So what I could do is say, um, so for um, reducing image size, I add seams. No, duh, I remove seams. For increasing image size, I add new pixels at the lowest cost seams. Right? What I mean by that is that, you know, suppose that I want to make this narrow image bigger, what I can do is I say, okay, this is my lowest cost seam, and then I kind of add some new pixels, one pixel wide in the middle here. And this and these new pixels could just be, for example, the average of the pixels on either side, right? So it's easy to just kind of hallucinate new pixels in between stuff that I didn't have before. So these basically are average of neighbors on either side. And the result of doing that is something like this. So this is the before shot. These are the lowest cost seams in the image. And again, you can see that they are passing through regions that are generally pretty flat, right? They kind of dodge around the frog and the leaf and so on. And then when I fatten up the image, I add pixels here. And again, you know, there is, a, there is some kind of distortion, right? For example, it's really tough to get the, the shadows of these leaves to be like super accurate. But like this leaf looks pretty much like it did before. The frog looks like it did before, right? So if you saw this as a new image, you might not think that anything had been changed, right? We're going to talk about some ways to make this even better in just a second, but that's the basic idea. Um, Another way that you can use this technique is to do inpainting, right? Removing of objects, right? So suppose I wanted to remove some stuff. So in this case, this is my bookshelf. So any of you guys who've been to my office have seen the shelf, right? Suppose I wanted to, okay, sorry, I guess I, I spoiled the example. So suppose I wanted to remove some stuff, but keep the image the same size, right? So the way that we would do inpainting from last time is to say, I'm going to kind of paint over the region I don't want. And I'm going to, for example, using the algorithm, take patches of image from other pieces of the, of the scene and stick them into that hole until the hole is filled up, right? That probably wouldn't work very well on this scene because the books have such a regular texture, right? Like there's no pixels that I could steal from somewhere and put them in the hole that wouldn't be noticeable to the eye. So instead what I can do is uh, the following. So, so scene carving. for inpainting, the idea is to say, okay, suppose that I want to remove 
this object, right? And so what I tell my algorithm is, okay, I want to get rid of this object by forcing the seams to go through it, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that object out by saying, you know, remove k seams that are forced to go through the object. Right? And so one way to force that is, for example, to say, OK, you know, remember my cost function was looking at the cost per pixel of the seam. So in this case, I could say, well, I could make this free to go through this object. Right? So seams will naturally gravitate towards passing through it, because that's the cheapest thing that they could possibly do. Right? And once I've cut down the image by that number of columns, then I resize it. Then I add k seams to get back the original size. And so here's that example again. So here's this bookshelf. And so what I do here was I removed two books from my bookshelf, right? So if you saw this, you probably wouldn't really think about what might be wrong. Here's the original image again. What I did was I said, OK, here are these two books, the red book and the purple book. And then I forced seams to go through that area, right? So this is saying. I want to find enough seams that chew away those books, right? And you can see that above and below the books, the seams are taking paths that are hopefully not too perceptible, going through constant intensity regions of the image. When I remove those books, shrinking that down, this is the seam carved image that I would get if all I cared about was removing the books, right? But if I want to get back to my aspect ratio that's bigger, then I fatten up this with the new seams that are low cost. So here again, these are different ones, right? These are now the lowest cost seams of what, are, what is left. And then I fatten those up back into this image. right? And so this kind of in-painting effect would be very difficult to achieve with the, with the method that we talked about at the end of last class, right? this kind of patch-based method. Instead, here I'm kind of moving pixels around all over the whole image. right? You can see where things have gotten a little bit screwy. right? So for example, like this book up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that a lot of seams pass through that. So if I look at how thin it was earlier, right, it was like you know not that thick. But then after I do this whole process, it gets really fat, right? But again, the whole point is that you don't really notice that that's a problem because it's all just a, it's just basically a constant white book, right? And so again, since I know my office really well, I can see some of the other places where it got screwed up. But if this was the only image you saw, you probably wouldn't notice a, a difference. Kind of um, conversely, there may be some parts of the image that I totally want to make sure I don't go through, right? And so uh, kind of conversely, to protect a region, give it you know, infinite uh, cost, right? So instead of making it very palatable for seams to pass through that region, instead you say, you know, it costs you a million to go through that pixel. So then your seams will totally avoid it. And so here's an example of why you might want to do that. So let me just show you a little bit of the video that accompanied the original seam carving paper. And so here, what you're going to see is, um, you know, showing that the authors implemented this kind of interactive resizing thing, right? So here, what you're seeing is the seams are actually getting removed on the fly, making the image narrower and then making the image larger, right? So you might imagine this is useful for, you know, if you've got a mobile device and you want to take an image from the web, normally, you know, the text on a web page will kind of naturally flow around to correspond to what your mobile device looks like, but the pictures don't, right? So this would be a way to do that. So here's an idea. This is the energy idea. So if I wanted to remove columns of the image and I wanted to make the image narrower that way, I could do so by saying, okay, I'm going to find the cheapest columns. If I were to remove them, this is looking at the gradient magnitude, I would end up with some image that looks really weird, right? And so probably what they're going to show next is the effect of removing the cheapest columns is going to result in some weirdo distortion, right? That would be bad. So instead, if I force the seams to pass through low energy regions, then when I remove those seams, this is kind of like a, a kind of a path showing the energy, which is like the gradient magnitude. That's the lowest cost seam. And as I chip away at those seams, I don't interfere with the edgy stuff, right? And this is just showing, you know, gradient magnitudes, and that you can 
kind of, I guess I'm talking about resizing it this way, you can also resize it the other way. So here if I wanted to totally change the size of the image, you kind of incrementally decide on am I going to make it a column shorter or a column, uh, or, or, or a row shorter at every frame. I kind of decide what I want to do. Um, so let me show you the, uh, the part about inpainting. So here's the inpainting idea. So here, uh, you know, if I don't do anything to protect things, then when I in, when I squish them, when I resize it, I may get squishy baby, right? So let's see that again. So basically, this is like saying if I resize without protection, put it that way, then I get distortion. Instead, of what I say is, okay, I paint over stuff and say this stuff here has infinite weight. You can't go through these regions; they have to be preserved in the original image. And then when I do the resizing, uh, that stuff is preserved, right? Um, or you could use a face detection algorithm to automatically find that stuff. This is the inpainting part. So now this is the other way of saying, definitely get rid of this stuff. And so um, this stuff, the seams are forced to go through there. And then when you erase the person, they just kind of, they were never there, right? You're out. So that's pretty fun. And so, um, so when this came out, uh, this is kind of fun. You know, here, get rid of the girl. <laughs> Just get rid of the guy. <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, and again, you know, this is a paper that, as you can see, appeared in a computer graphics conference. But fundamentally. There's nothing that you couldn't understand from just taking this image processing class, right? So I mean, a lot of image processing courses might give you this as an assignment. If I had given a little more homework, I maybe would have asked you to implement scene carving. So, um, so this is fun. Um, and one thing that may go wrong, though, and actually, so as soon as this came out, people started to think about how to make it better, right? And so one idea that seems obvious in retrospect is that what makes a good seam is not so much about what you remove, right? So if I remove a, a bunch of pixels and I look at what gradients happened along those pixels, in the new image, those pixels are not there anymore, right? So why do I care so much about that? What I really should care about is what new gradients would I introduce if I were to remove that edge, right? So kind of what I mean is instead of looking back, instead of looking, uh, I have to make sure I do this the right way. Uh, is it backward or forward? Yes, you want to look at the forward energy, right? So original seam carving looked what I would call backward better is to look forward. And what I mean by that is what new edges, for example, would be introduced if we removed this seam. I think I have a picture that illustrates this better. Yeah, so here's the idea. Suppose the idea is to say, okay, if I were to remove these shaded pixels along a seam, I would be generating some new pixels that were now close together that were not adjacent in the previous image, right? So here's the simplest case. So if I remove these two pixels in a column, right, then this pixel and this pixel are suddenly neighbors, right? And I should have a cost that says, well, what is the gradient between those two new neighbors, right? How much energy am I introducing into the image by removing these pixels? And the same way here, if I remove these two diagonal pixels, I get new neighbors both in the vertical and the horizontal directions, right? So instead, it was a simple twist to say, OK, well, what if you instead removed pixels according to how much new energy there was going to be? That turned out to make better looking images. And here's a kind of example of here is the original image. If I did regular seam carving, I would get an image that looks like this. And so if you compare this guy's weird like foot, right? This is the before shot. Regular seam carving would make this kind of weird aftershot, whereas improving the seam carving kind of makes a better looking uh, image, right? So I think that in general, people would prefer to use the forward energy instead of the backward energy. And there are some details about how that can be done efficiently. I mean, it turns out that you can't quite 
Well, I guess I guess maybe you could do it with dynamic programming, but it's probably easier to do it with graph cuts, which is this algorithm we talked about last time. So there's an efficient way of doing it. So that was all kind of like maybe 2007, 2008. And then people started to think about, OK, well, what's an even more exciting way to, to uh, fool around with images? And so that led to a series of patch-based algorithms. OK, so let me kind of get there. So here's the idea. So let's suppose that I have some really uh, complicated image, right? So you will find that seam carving to resize this image, to make it smaller especially, will immediately go bad. And the reason for that is that there are no nice low cost seams in this picture, right? So you're immediately forced to make some bad choices about what pixels to remove. And if you keep on chewing away, you know, seam by seam, you'll get something that immediately looks like crap, right? So the idea was to say, okay, well, to resize this image, this image has a lot of repetitive texture, right? It's got, you know, repetitions here, repetitions here. And so if I need to make this image smaller, Maybe what I should do is not try to keep every you know, part of the original image, but instead make an image that represents what the old one was about. Right? So for example, if I had to make a smaller version, maybe this would be an OK representation. The reason being that this image contains kind of you know, all of the textural elements of the original image. Right? So kind of a more uh, real world way to think about this is to suppose I wanted to resize a building that had you know, 80 windows, right? So instead of trying to keep all 80 of those windows, maybe when I switch it down, I start to throw away windows, right? Because all the windows look fundamentally the same. I'm going to show you a video in a second that makes that idea more clear. And so that led to this idea of, um, you know, what's called bidirectional similarity. And the premise there is as follows. So I have an original image, I, and a retargeted image, I prime. OK? So I'm, I'm trying to create I prime based on some constraints that say, OK, I prime is the size compared to the original. OK? And so there are kind of two principles. So I prime should be what we call complete, which means that it should contain as much visual information from I as possible. Right? So we don't want to throw any elements of the original image away. We want to keep all that stuff. And the other one is that I prime should be coherent, meaning uh, no visual information or no kind of new visual information that wasn't an I, right? And this is kind of along the lines of this forward energy I just talked about, saying that we don't want to introduce anything in the new image that didn't appear somewhere in the old image, right? So we don't want any artifacts that we don't like in the new image, OK? And so then what we do is we form a cost function that tries to um, encapsulate these two desirable, desirable things, right? So cost function, and this is going to be something that is uh, complicated, so let me just warn you. So he is saying that the difference or the distance between the original image and some possible new image, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, uh, I'm going to look at here n is um, patches, which are just blocks of pixels in i. And over every one of these patches, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the average. So let me, let me write this down first, and then I'm going to explain what it means.
So what this is saying is, I look at a whole bunch of patches in the original image, and I find the best corresponding patches in the new image, and I compute that average distance, right? I want that to be small, right? And so this is basically saying that um, this is that completeness criterion, right? This is basically like saying that everything in the old image should somehow be represented in the new image, right? Every pixel, every patch in the old image should have a good match somewhere in the new image, okay? And then the other way is to say this, where I take patches in my newly generated image and I look for the best patches in the old image. So these are patches in I prime, and these are the best matches in I, and this is the coherence thing. Right, this is like saying that if I take a patch of my newly created image and look for it somewhere in the old image, I should find a good match to everything, right? So there should be no region of the new image that doesn't match up with something in the old image. So kind of I have this two directions, right? This is why it's called bidirectional similarity. I look from old to new, and I look from new to old. And so these patches are basically computed, you know, the patches are just um, blocks of pixels at multiple scales. That just means multiple sizes. Okay. And so it's not that hard to kind of formulate the cost function, but then to actually minimize the cost function is really difficult, right? Because in the beginning, I don't have any idea what my new image should look like, right? So kind of the way that these patch-based algorithms work is that I'm slowly building up the image from uh, the old one, right? So kind of what I might say is, okay, and the details of, the, of making this work are a little bit arcane, so I don't want to go through the whole thing right now, but the idea is to say, okay, you know, Suppose I want to make the image a little bit smaller, right? What I might do first is initialize that small image with just a rescaled version of the original image. And then I try to refine each of those pixel intensities to bring it into line with my cost function, right? So I need to have a place to start from. But actually, it's not that hard to, to show how you might update this. So let me just give you some flavor of how that works, right? So kind of what I need to do is this image is made up of pixels, right? And so how would I know how much every pixel of the new image contributes to this cost function, right? So that pixel is going to play a role in a bunch of patches here, right? So for example, suppose that I consider, you know, pixel J over here in the new image, okay? So pixel J is going to contribute to a bunch of patches over here, right? So certainly it's going to contribute to Basically, you know, say I've got three by three patches, it's gonna to contribute to nine patches over here. So there are gonna be nine cost function terms that depend on pixel J here. This is a little bit harder to figure out because I don't really know which patches over in image I are gonna have pixel J in their best matching blocks, right? So could be zero, could be 50. I don't really know uh, which pixel, which best match blocks are gonna contain this. So let me just say, this is a little more mathematically. So how does pixel J in I prime contribute to this cost function? So it will be a member of, you know, let's say, uh, W squared W by W patches in I prime. And so the way that that will uh, contribute to the cost function is the following, right? So that's like saying that, you know, if this is my I and this is my I prime and this is the pixel that I'm trying to change the color of, well, that means that for every block that contains it, there's some best matching block over here, and then I'm comparing this color 
to this color in this position, right? So there's a pixel over here in I that corresponds to this pixel over here, right? And if I were to look at this block instead, there's some other block over here, and now I have to compare this pixel over here in this position, right? So kind of what I have is uh, the contribution is something like the sum over all these blocks, some pixel value over in image i minus the pixel color in image i prime that I'm trying to create, right? So here all I'm doing is looking at the sum of squares of corresponding pixels, right? And so this is what I want to optimize over. But this is easy, right? This is just a squared cost function term. So in theory, you know, I could just take the derivative of this with respect to i prime of j and say it equals zero and get some function for that pixel, right? It's a little bit harder to understand, you know, what pixels over from i prime contribute when I'm looking at the other terms. So the other way, which is um, completeness, is less certain. By which I mean, you know, again, here's my pixel j. The way I do the completeness part is I start with blocks over here, and I find corresponding blocks over here that are the best matches, right? And so it could be that this pixel is lonely and never gets any best matches, right? So I could have no versions over here in, in image i that match up with that over here in image i prime. Or I could have one that says, okay, the best match over here happens to be this, and so that means I should compare this value to this value, right? So instead I have kind of like a, um, a cost function term that says like this. This is kind of like saying, you know, uh, blocks in I whose best matches contain j in i prime, right? So I don't know how many of those I have in, in advance, but once I know which ones they are, I have a cost function term that looks kind of similar, right? And then if I think about, you know, my original cost function, it's like I'm adding up something like this plus something like this, and I can, you know, uh, do something along the lines of um, to find i prime of j, take the derivative of um, this big cost function with respect to that pixel and set equal to zero. And what I get is just something that's kind of like a weighted average of a bunch of pixels from the other image, right? So um, I guess I can write it down, not that it's really critical right now. But this is like saying, you know, my new intensity is just going to be a bunch of pixels from the completeness term plus a bunch of pixels from the uh, coherence term and then just some weirdo weighted average that says how many of these there are, right? So the idea is if I knew which blocks matched up between the two images, it's easy to generate the new color. And so the kind of general approach is I use an iterative algorithm to create I prime. And the simplest thing is something like you know, I, I initialize I prime with kind of, say, a resized or rescaled version of I. Then I match blocks from um, I prime to I. That gives me this term. And then I match blocks from 
i to i prime. That gives me this term. Then I update this value according to this equation. And then I kind of iterate, right? And so what happens is that what you see is that slowly, as you cycle through this process, you get this i prime that starts to kind of shift pixels around. And I think the easiest thing to do is just kind of to show you a couple examples of that, which, I'll, which I'm going to do in a second. So the only advantage, or the only disadvantage of this is that this, this idea works really well, but when it was first proposed, it was super time consuming, right? Like, it turned out that it may have taken, you know, like 10 minutes to make this newly retargeted image, whereas you really want something that is interactive, right? You want to be able to have the user go into Photoshop and just kind of like drag the corners of something and have it automatically change its size, right? So the original implementation of this didn't do that at all, right? So what came on the scene to make this suddenly better was an algorithm called patch match. which was basically a fast implementation of um, you know, minimizing this bidirectional similarity cost function. And part of the secret sauce had to do with the fact that whenever you're running this algorithm, you're constantly matching blocks between images at different scales. And that constant kind of searching and matching for the best match is very time consuming. And so patch match was a clever way of thinking about say, okay, you know, it, it turns out that a lot of times you don't have to actually run that matching process from scratch every time. You can save results from previous iterations and also you can get away with not finding the exact best match, but kind of like the approximate match. So this is kind of like a, I think it's built on an approximate nearest neighbor algorithm. So if you're an algorithms person, you can read more about kind of, you know, you can kind of bound the performance of how well can I do with a exact nearest neighbor algorithm versus how well can I do with an approximate nearest neighbor algorithm. That's what made this faster. And so suddenly this became something that was um, very quick to do. And so I'm going to show you the patch batch video in just a second. Um, and let me just say that, you know, this whole pr approach enables not only resizing, but also what I would call kind of recompositing and reshuffling. And so what I mean by that is that, as you'll see in the video in just a second, what you may say is, actually maybe it's just easier to show you the video than it is to, to talk about the video. So here is the, the patch patch video. So the idea here is along the lines of saying, okay, um, suppose that I want to take this image of a house and what I've done is I've dragged this triangle around the top of the house, kind of like cutting and pasting, and then I say I want, well here, let me just play the video from the, from the start here. So this is, this is kind of like a little bit of, this is showing the old scene carving idea where, um, you know, as I change the size of the image, it looks good for a while, that's, that's the idea. This is the bidirectional similarity. And let me pause for a second just to say that, let me go back to this. So the idea behind this bidirectional similarity was that if I wanted to resize this image to this, it would produce images that kind of looked the same, but were not, uh, that, that kind of uh, deleted out repeat, repetitive texture, right? So for example, here, I've got all these windows that look the same. And instead of trying to seam carve between all those windows and switch them together, instead, the bidirectional similarity will start to actually literally just remove windows, right? So this, this building used to have six windows, and now it has two windows, right? But the, the, there are no parts of this image that are not really present somewhere in this image and vice versa, right? So kind of the advantage of bidirectional similarity is it gets rid of this repetitive texture, but it doesn't introduce any weird artifacts. And so, Simakov et al. This is the paper that here it says five minutes for a 250 by 200 input image. That's pretty, that's pretty time consuming. So this is the paper that does interactive reshuffling. So like saying, okay, move this thing to there and it automatically moves the pixels around to make the most compelling new image, right? So here I'm doubling this thing, right? And so 
You could also do inpainting by saying, okay, I want to remove this thing, so there should be no patches for the original image that contain that person. So it's a pretty cool approach. Let me, let me show that again and talk over it. So what are the things that we're illustrating here? So the first one is basically saying, I'm taking the original image, I'm drawing a box around this thing, and I'm moving that box over to some new region, right? That's like saying those pixels are nailed down in I prime, right? So those pixels are fixed. Now all the other pixels in the image are forced to kind of come along in such a way that the new image looks as much as possible like the old image and doesn't have any artifacts, right? So that's why when we drag the top over here, you can see that the whole building kind of shifts over and if you were to compare these things carefully, right? So I mean, what happened between here and here, you can see that, you know, we lost some grass over here, but there's a lot of grass that's still around, right? So bidirectional similarity would say that that's okay because there's no texture in this new image that wasn't really present somewhere in the old image, right? And so I can kind of drag this around. This is what they called reshuffling. And what happened here was now the user is basically saying, sorry, now the user is basically saying, not only do I want to fix, you know, the top of the image, you know, the top of the roof at these pixels, but I also want a copy of it over here. Now you other pixels have to kind of follow along, right? So the way that you do this reshuffling is the user is kind of nailing down constraints to say these pixels of I prime are fixed, make everything else match up. And kind of conversely, um, in painting works by saying, okay, now this is my original image, but I don't want any pixels in my new image to come from these regions in image I, right? So that's kind of like a modification of the completeness term by saying, okay, I want everything from image I but this stuff. You can't have any of that stuff there, right? So then the cost function is forced to say, okay, well, I'm never going to pick any patches that contain that person. That, that stuff will never appear in my rendered image, right? So again, this is a, a very different approach than the kind of chewing away the inside of the whole algorithm, right? Here what's happening is the whole image is getting recreated, right? It's not just like I'm changing what's happening inside the whole. The whole image is kind of subtly changing as I make these operations. And then retargeting, again, is a similar idea where all I'm saying is, you know, I have some constraints. So maybe I say that, you know, the boundary of the image has to be uh, corresponding to the boundary pixels, like the maybe a five or 10 pixel wide window around the original image. That's what fixes some pixels in I prime. And then all the other pixels have to kind of follow in to make an image that has the same size and is coherent and complete. So we kind of talked about the algorithm a little bit. Let me show you some more stuff. So basically, um, another thing that they do is, you know, you realize after you do this for a while that you have to put some constraints onto the image to make it look good, right? So here, this is kind of on the fly changing the image, but um, you can make things look a little bit better by forcing certain lines in the image to stay where they are. So here what the user is going to do is say, okay, I need this line and these lines to remain kind of coherent in the new image, right? So you can kind of put down these kind of vanishing line and perspective constraints that would otherwise prevent your composite from looking a little bit funky, right? So here, for example, this, this line here is not matching up in the middle, and that's because there's no constraints on that. So here, instead, what the user does is draws a boundary and says, in the recomposite, make sure that this line here is not screwed up. Right? And then the recomposite looks like something where I'm going to basically abbreviate some windows. Right? I guess I skipped ahead by mistake. Um, this again is a similar idea of what can go wrong with scene carving. And the reason is that here, the only thing I can do is kind of remove pixels and squish them together. And so I immediately have problems in really edgy regions. Right? And so the idea here is to give the user a little more control, and we can do the same kinds of things where we say, okay, I'm going to uh, protect a certain region. <laughs> yeah, so here, here they're kind of saying, uh, the user can step in and say, I'm going to draw these green lines that specify kind of like vanishing lines, and I'm going to protect 
the little boy to make sure that he never gets removed out. And then my recomposite looks like something that is a little bit better. And so here again, this is not fully automatic. The user has to step in and make a few choices about things. But you know, here you can see that what happened was that if you compare this to the original image, there were all these, um, look at the fuse bottles, right? So here, there were like 10 bottles. And in the new image, there's only like uh, four bottles or something like that, right? So again, the idea is that this is OK because there's no, you know, every, you know, if I can draw a box around every bottle in the I prime, there's a good looking bottle somewhere in I that matches up with it, right? And vice versa, right? So I'm not losing anything by throwing away a few bottles of fuse as opposed to trying to keep them all there, right? So that the essence of the image is still the same. That was the key insight of this, of this work. Um, but the, the patch match algorithm makes it possible to kind of do this interactive reshuffling that's really compelling, right? So you can just kind of like grab stuff and move it around. And this is in the more recent versions of Photoshop. Um, and so, um, again, you might argue that none of this stuff is necessarily like ready for putting in a, in a press ad. Like you wouldn't immediately take a result of this and, and show it to somebody. But you know, with enough tweaking, you can get an image that is, you know, moved around. And this happens a lot, where basically, you know, you imagine that uh, this is a visual effects kind of problem. There's stuff hanging around in the scene. The person is not quite in the right place. This kind of technology allows you to really seamlessly change things um, in a way that, you know, it's a little bit scary. So this is, the, this is the last part where they're just kind of showing off all the cool things they can do by moving things around, copy and pasting, right? And so again, this was already, uh, I don't know what the year of this was. It was probably like 2008, 2009. And so here again, it says this is now in Adobe Photoshop CS5 or CS6, right? OK, so um, that's, that's really all I, all, all I wanted to say. I mean, the other thing is that um, the final thing is that you can kind of also apply to you know, video, right? So we didn't talk a lot about video processing in this class, although some of you are doing video processing projects here. Uh, and so, you know, you could do the same kind of idea. Suppose that you wanted to, um, well, what's a good example? So uh, I noticed that there's like this thing on the Major League Baseball website that produces a automatic summary of a game, right? So a baseball game is super long, right? And so instead, you condense that down into a 10 minute summary that just shows the important stuff, right? So in theory, that's the same kind of idea here, right? The summary should contain everything important from the game, and it shouldn't have anything that shouldn't be, you know, that, that didn't happen in the game, right? And so you might imagine that you could apply the same kind of thing to automatic video summarization, right? Um, the same kind of ideas apply. And so, um, so this is kind of a, you know, an area of some active research in both computer vision and computer graphics. But ultimately, um, aside from the under the hood algorithm of the nearest neighbor thing, it's fundamentally an image processing problem of, of finding corresponding patches that match, right? There's no real uh, intelligence of the algorithm to identify objects automatically. It's just matching pixels, right? So um, again, this is kind of a fun, uh, you know, fun side note. So any questions or comments? So you can definitely, I mean, so if you have, uh, you know, Adobe license, you can start to fool around with this. Um, certainly, you can go online and find the scene carving implementation, so it's very easy to get that code and fool around with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, as I said uh, last time, I do actually now use some of this stuff just to like touch up some of the photos that I have that are not quite right. You know, it turns out that this has made made a lot easier for the consumer uh, to change your images, and so um, it's worth taking a look at. Okay, and so the last place we're going to go for uh, the last lecture is going to be on uh, a little bit of a, a different topic, which is going to be non-rigid shape modeling. So some of you, are, for example, are doing like template-based matching to find like license plates, for example, right? So license plate is a rigid object. It's a rectangle you can kind of search for. But what if you're trying to find like a face or a hand that can change its shape and fingers, right? So we're going to talk about what are called active shape models for doing those kinds of problems. So that should be the last lecture. And then, uh, then that will be the end of the class.